Welcome to our first Manufacturing Woes show. This is a show I'll be hosting the second Tuesday of each month to bring people together in our industry to talk about what really happens in the world of manufacturing. And it ain't all pretty, believe me. Our show aims to bring experts together to share their manufacturing nightmares, train wrecks, and meltdowns, and also reveal the wisdom gained from their mistakes and how they have learned to refine their skills and add more value at their companies. I'm Sarah Scudder, CMO at SourceDay, and today's show host. Our platform integrates with ERP systems for manufacturing and distribution companies, so my team and I have lived through the good, the bad, and the ugly. The founders of SourceDay spent years in manufacturing before deciding to build our platform to help manufacturers automate PO changes. Today, I'm joined by Jonathan, and potentially his son. We may have a special visitor with us, a, a mini supply chain star in the making, Sneha, Chris, and Curtis. They have extensive manufacturing experience and I've asked them to share their wisdom and stories today. To kick off our conversation, please put in the comments where in the world you are joining us from and a word or phrase that describes your craziest manufacturing experience. Think of the absolutely most wildest thing you've lived through in manufacturing and try to describe it in a word or phrase for us. Don't be shy throughout the show. Please engage with us in the comments and post questions anytime. So with that, Jonathan, I think we'll kick off the panel discussion today with you. So I'd like to start by having you talk to us a little bit about your background and how you got into manufacturing. Hey everybody, yeah, it's uh, it's really been an interesting uh, story for me as it relates to my career in manufacturing. Actually, as it stands now, I'm I'm not in manufacturing any, anymore, but I never forget where I came from. And I started out uh, more than 20 years ago in a very large uh, industrial firm, Ingersoll Rand, and they had many uh, different brands that you might recognize. Along their uh, their span, so they had train air conditioner, Schlage locks, club car, golf cars, uh, all those uh, brands that are pretty much household names. But I started out in the in the company as a, an export manager and working on the logistics and getting our our ocean freight, uh, getting our air freight, and really uh, working on doing the the buying the nuts and bolts of procurement and supply chain for our plants that were offshore in China and Brazil and in Mexico. And it was really uh, interesting for that first year or so. I got to learn uh, the basics of, of procurement, the basics of supply chain, how suppliers work, you know, how they respond to uh, our needs and our requirements. But one of the, the most interesting things that I witnessed and I experienced in that first year is that while working at Ingersoll Rand in one of the, the factories, uh, it was actually a union shop and we were faced with a, a strike uh, by some of the workers. So I remember uh, one of the, the factory leaders came to my desk because the, the corporate functions were attached to uh, the factory location. So one of the, the factory leaders came to my desk and said, hey, we need you to get out there on the floor right now. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, wow, uh, what can I do? I don't know how to build these uh, pieces of equipment. I, I don't know how to operate the machinery, but I gave it a shot. And so I went out there and I started working on, on the equipment right on the line with some uh, workers that were veterans of the, the company for many, many years. So I was learning from them and they gave me some very quick and instant feedback. They said, hey man, you're a little bit too slow for this. Why don't you go build some shipping crates? So I, I took that as an opportunity to learn uh, how to use some uh, factory power tools. So that was uh, fun. But really, I think the overall lesson that I learned uh, in my first year and being in, in manufacturing is that you gotta be flexible and you gotta be ready for anything that can happen and that can come across your desk. So overall, it was a, a good experience and I, I still uh, reflect on that in a, in a positive way. Jonathan, a fun fact about yourself that most people don't know. You know, uh, something fun is actually 
I got married to the the same woman twice in one year. Uh, so my wife is is Russian, and uh, we got married in St. Louis. That was in in April of 2010, and then we followed up uh, a few months later in September and got married in her hometown in, in Moscow. And actually, uh, I can uh, thank my manufacturing background in in getting connected with her and that. You know, we had at Ingersoll Rand a uh, manufacturing plant in, in Russia. So I, I asked some of my colleagues uh, how I would go about uh, asking permission of my uh, then uh, fiance's father uh, for, for marriage. And so they walked me through the whole process, gave me all the uh, language training. Uh, so it was great. So I, again, I have uh, that bit of fun fact, but I owe it all to my manufacturing relationships and background. And we're looking forward to your son hopefully joining us on the panel. Our supply chain star in the making may make a guest appearance. <laughs> Indeed. Jonathan, thanks so much for being here today. It'll be fun. Thank you. Chris, you're up next. Would like to have you start by introducing yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, um, how you got into manufacturing, what you're doing today and make sure to also share a fun personal fact about yourself that most people don't know. And then I'll, I'll throw out your first question. Sure. So uh, yes, I'm Chris Harrington. I am the president and COO of Gen Alpha Technologies. And we actually um, have built a digital commerce solution for manufacturers. It is designed to help them uh, sell their parts uh, both their aftermarket new equipment and used equipment online. So what's really unique about us as a business is that as founders, we all came from manufacturing and we had a responsibility to grow the aftermarket business and support our equipment in operation. And, uh, you know, in our time with a large uh, manufacturer in mining, which I'm going to draw my stories from today, um, we saw our business grow in the aftermarket from 250 million to 1.2 billion when we were sold to Caterpillar. So it was tremendous growth. But one of the things that we really under we we began to understand is how the world of servicing equipment was changing and how you could utilize digital to support that change. So um, that's a, a bit about what I'm doing today. I actually started in manufacturing myself after I left the Navy. And I always like to say that uh, manufacturing chose me because uh, when I was a, uh, in high school, there was a local manufacturing company that gave an award away for the, uh, for the student athletes of the year. So it happened that they gave an award to females and males in each school in our district. And then they had this really wonderful evening that they did in their, um, it, they rented a space and they brought in a great speaker. The, the speaker for the night that I attended was Coach K. So your, your parents got to attend and here was the, the coach of Duke and I was a basketball player. So this was just really uh, awesome and cool for me. So when I got out of the Navy and I was looking for my first career and what to do next, I thought, well, why don't I go apply at this manufacturer who had saw something in me in high school? And I share that story because, you know, when we think about STEM and we think about all the ways that we're trying to encourage young people and specifically young women to uh, enter into manufacturing, this was one way that I went in is that, you know, a manufacturer in the local area was recognizing um, in this case, student athletes. But I think as manufacturers uh, get, you know, start to recognize different, um, you know, younger people and share with them what's happening in manufacturing and what their career plans can be, it might be something that they would then get interested in. So that's a little bit about me. And a fun personal fact that fun most people don't know fact. about you. Um, well, you shared it in the LinkedIn message, but I, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. So a very typical Friday night would look like, um, you know, a fish fry in a whiskey old fashioned. So, um, not everybody's a whiskey old fashioned fan here. You know, we, I think we're the largest, uh, drinkers of, um, or Wisconsin is, uh, of another bourbon, but I'm a whiskey drinker and whiskey old fashioned is my drink of choice. 
So, Chris, when we were at dinner a couple of weeks ago, I think you actually had a watermelon drink. Yes, it was called Watermelon Sugar uh, <laughs> from the Harry Styles song. I had to, since I like the song, I had to check out the drink. Yes. <laughs> so, Chris, my question for you is back in your machine operating days, tell me about the impact to your operation when raw materials did not arrive on time. Sure. So, you know, in the earliest days of my career in manufacturing, I worked as a slitting machine operator in a clean room. And I can recall a story when we were having a shortage of materials. It was late December, end of the quarter, and our fiscal year was ending. Uh, we were very busy trying to get as much product out the door as possible. Um, I was part of a company that offered profit sharing. And as workers on the shop floor, we were all motivated to do everything we could to achieve our numbers in order to have the highest bonus possible. Well, that particular year, our supplier shortages were impacting our machine schedule. And, you know, as an operator, you were responsible for picking your materials in the warehouse, changing blades, setting your machine tolerances, running the machine, and then loading your end product on a pallet before it was packaged to be shipped. And I can't recall what the exact problem was, but I know the disruption was creating challenges in defining the production schedule. And on this particular day, I changed the machine three times before I ever produced any final product. Now, what that meant for me in a clean room is that I had to take off all the clean room garments, coveralls, shoe covers, you know, head cover, hop on the forklift to get the raw materials from the warehouse, pre prepare them for entry into the clean room, and then put all my cl clean, cl clean room clothing back on in order to then set the tolerances on the machine. And I just remember that that schedule changed three times. I thought management had lost their mind. And, you know, oftentimes when you're on the shop floor, you don't get an explanation as to why things keep changing. You just have to make the change. And I'm sure the sales team was calling customers and the purchase team, purchasing team was calling uh, various suppliers. But on the floor, I felt like my shift was wasted and we lost valuable production time to help us achieve our numbers. So, as my time in manufacturing has evolved into various different roles, I always remember how material shortages can impact production and mostly the people performing the task. You know, I look for clear ways to communicate, uh, you know, the supply challenges up and down the organization. And I look for small ways to thank people for their hard work, even if it doesn't feel like on any given day that they're having the impact that they would hope to. Awesome. And, and we've seen that accelerated in the last couple of years with so many challenges with companies getting products and parts and entire production lines being shut down for days or weeks. Yep. We're seeing it everywhere. Well, Chris, thank you so much for being with us today. Sneha, you are up next joining us from beautiful SoCal. We actually have some, some decent weather today here in Austin, too. It looks a little overcast, but it's supposed to be in the 70s today. So, Sia, so yeah, I would love to have you introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how you got into manufacturing. And then would also like to have you share a fun personal fact that most people don't know about you. For sure. First of all, thank you so much for having me today. I'm super pumped, excited to share my experiences along some great industry leaders, the panelists today, and of course, all the viewers. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I actually did not like, uh, you know, Chris was saying that manufacturing chose her. Uh, I think I chose manufacturing. And uh, this is a start with like when I did my uh, bachelor's, I decided to do it in electronics and instrumentation, unlike a lot of my friends who took computer science. So I always knew that I had to do, I had to do this and, and not something related to uh, computer science. But 
then I actually joined the likes of um, the home automation industries. So joined them, did some QA. So I actually started in QA. My career was in QA and then moved on to do more of supply chain. So doing a lot of R&D, launching new products, which was super exciting. And that's how I my journey started. And when it comes to supply chain, I've done pretty much end to end, like starting with procurement to um, demand planning. So, you know, the strategic side and the tactical side and the logistics piece, then bringing it back and then finally manufacturing it. So making it. So that actually gives me a very good perspective of how a product actually is, you know, uh, how we bring in components. We actually put it together, make it, sell it, bring it back and all that. So amazing journey so far been very thankful to all the industries that i've worked with and um, uh, while i do not work in manufacturing right now as jonathan was mentioning i still will always remember where uh, my all my experiences still as passionate about manufacturing as i've always been and um, and you know i mean there's so many uh, pain points that I do want to share, but amidst all of that, I just have to mention that the learning that have come through the journey, through the years that uh, I've been in this is um, just unimaginable, incredible. And just, um, I, I would always encourage everyone who thinks that manufacturing is uh, kind of a legacy industry, is behind, uh, like to just oh, get, get out there, be there, see things happen because trust me all the products that you use today somewhere is being manufactured somewhere so this industry can really open doors your eyes on how things happen and move around the world so definitely want to give uh that uh shout there and one fun fact but i guess you did add it on linkedin and i guess most of people most, most of my friends know that too like i was visiting china for one of my supplier visits and um when i visited some of my peers or when the first visit to china uh and living in china was one different experience let's trust me i was a vegetarian back then i'm not anymore um so uh you know, when I introduced my name to them, they they thought they were like very amazed and they were like, wow, you know, Chinese. And I said, no, I don't know Chinese. I'm not sure what you're talking about. And they said, well, you just said me how I'm like, no, uh, I just said Sneha, that's my name. And then that's how I got to know that Nihao meaning means hello. And maybe I was using the best accent there for them to understand that was my name rather than speaking their language. But that's the fun fact about me. And uh, you might see a guest appearance from my two boys, two little boys who are also very, very interested in supply chain whenever I'm speaking. And, and sometimes they actually repeat the words that I say, which I'm like, wow. Uh, so I'm happy about that. So you might see some guest, guest appearances there as well. But thank We're you happy to have us. supply chain stars on our show anytime. So all the kiddos are welcome. <laughs> So, you know, my, my first um, my first question for you is tell me about a time when you had to deal with the craziness of meeting a customer demand. Yeah, for sure. I think uh, I do want to mention something specific that happened during these crazy times that we are living in. Uh, and I believe that all of us could could easily and well relate to. So there are so many stories that I could, but I'll pick this one. And especially around COVID, there were many market segments that actually saw a slump in their demand. But there were certain markets that were actually going up, for example, the medical uh, field specifically, because there was a huge demand of uh, all the medical equipments. So one of the potential customers uh, uh, was serving this market. And the demand of suddenly saw an increase of two to three folds, which was great, a great problem to have, of course. But um, then how do you meet them? How do you make sure that you make uh, you grab on this opportunity and make it happen? And of course, the burden always lies on supply chain and op operations to step up the game and get it uh, done. And, um, and, you know, while all of this happening, you know, the demand is coming up, we also all got to know that you know, we you all must be aware that our offshore suppliers were also running in the same boat as the rest of us were around the world where um, there was a demand shortage there were, it was hard to manufacture stuff so this was actually creating ripples both downstream and upstream um supply chain and that um and the dependency on our offshore suppliers wasn't something that was a possibility or could have um helped us at that point in time and um 
So there was a strict stringent timeline that we had to get things done, bring this together. And so, of course, I started working with our procurement and some of our commodity managers who actually, you know, uh, made their relationship magic happen. And we were able to get some of our, you know, secondary suppliers locally to get things uh, done for us. And uh, then moving on to the ops piece. And that was challenging again, because, you know, we were in COVID times and then you cannot really run your capacity, like at full capacity, you have to manage physical distancing. You have to break down in shifts. Not everyone likes being in shifts. You have to take care of your people while doing all of this. So something that really, uh, well, I'll come to that later, but anyway, we, we came, we did that. We had to um, run, uh, more than two shifts to make it happen. And the best part was actually seeing our people, our um, our associates actually come together for, you know, the moment you explain to them the need of the market, what exactly are we serving? You just see that loyalty. You just see that uh, passion coming through them too. And they were already given, um, you know, given the times, given the scare. We didn't know what what's going on, what could happen. Um, hey there, uh, what could happen? And they still, you know, stood up. We divided shifts. They were ready to uh, show up every day to make it happen for our customers. And uh, I cannot tell you the gratitude I have for everyone that's standing on that shop floor and actually making things for us. I guess they are the, they are our real heroes. They make things happen for our customers. And so always like, you know, Chris, as you were mentioning, always find those small moments to appreciate them as much as we can. The, le the more we do, the less it is. That's what I feel like having them, making them part of our changes and process is so important. Communicate, communicate, communicate. I cannot stress enough for that. Whichever role you are in, you have to make sure you're being transparent and communicating as much as possible, of course, professionally and good stuff. <laughs> um, and so anyways, we took care of the mini spring pee and um, of course, then move to the quality aspect as well, because it was, you know, going to a market that is very, you know, susceptible to any kind of failures. It was very important that the customers were trust that we were following. So we actually worked with virtual Gemba. Not sure uh, if you guys have heard of it, but pretty much, you know, installing cameras, making sure that the customers could watch the process, could get the copies of the reports, the test reports and all of that. So that was, uh, you know, kind of an innovation that was happening on the shop floor for us, uh, for our customers. So that was amazing as well. And finally, the logistics piece, which was, I don't want to miss that because that was crazy. Like one of the problem was, the, you know, the last minute rush that we always, always run into where uh, there's some problem, the truck hasn't left, it's not arriving on time, we might miss the deadline. And then like, literally that time we had to use our own fleet, meaning our own truck. And uh, I wish I, I wish I, I, I would have been ready to actually drive a car to our suppliers facility to load boxes. But literally during this process, what I learned was actually moving a pallet jack uh, so literally like going to the warehouse and bringing the boxes back in production, like working with our associates. So it was fun. I learned new things. We innovated and uh, we made it happen. And, as, and you know, in the end, when we were able to, you know, meet that uh, demand, it was all worth it. And as I always say, like supply chain and operations make things happen. And so we did it. Um, and I, I just feel that, um, uh, I there was no possibility that this could have happened if my associates were not with us on the same page, um, running at the same pace that we wanted them to. So I like thank them all the time that I'm on the shop floor working with them and try to make sure that I understand their um, their issues as much as they understand mine and the business issues as well. Awesome. Thank you for that story. Very interesting. And we'll have to see you in action, Sneha, sometime driving forklifts and pallet, pallets around. Forklifts, I couldn't. I don't have the license, but pallet, yes, I do. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for being here today. Curtis, excited to have you on the show. You're actually joining us from a real office. We can see all the, the work behind you. So we'd love to have you um, introduce yourself and tell us how you got into manufacturing and then also share a fun, interesting, personal fact that a lot of people don't know about you. Okay. Um, how I got into manufacturing, I really don't know if you would call it getting into it. It's, uh, you know, getting out of college and looking for an opportunity. I worked in the oil field, out in the field, 
uh, on rigs and and uh, different locations uh, for a couple of years, and then found out that um, you know that's really really hard work, especially with a college degree to uh, have that opportunity. But at the same time, I learned a lot of uh, mechanical and chemical. Um, you know, things that uh, you wouldn't normally learn from an office or watching a video or having interaction with a, with a supplier or a client. So that being said, I went into uh, distribution and uh, industrial distribution. So then again, making sales calls and working the actual warehouse on the floor, you know, it was a smaller distributor. So we all kind of did everything. So at the same time, you learn procurement, sales manager um, operations, you know, you learn a little bit of, uh, you know, logistics, a little bit of everything. And then the opportunity to come into manufacturing was through, through that procurement experience, which is uh, here at Lyondell, Lyondell Basel. And I've been not, not sure if I'm going to stick with purchasing. I've been doing it for about 30 years now, so I'm still trying to decide but um, I've been uh, been here almost um, 20 years, and uh, that's kind of my how I got into manufacturing is uh, the opportunity uh, to do something different and new, and still kind of be able to look back at um, look look back at uh, my previous experiences and and how it uh, was, you know, everything fell in line, and uh, here I am. So. Um, and then a fact about yourself that most people don't know. Um, most people don't know that uh, I um, am involved in a prison ministry. And so I visit a maximum security prison on a weekly basis and um, disciple and minister to uh, several, um, several inmates um, on a regular basis and correspond. Awesome. You do a lot to give back. So thank you, Curtis, for, for all your efforts. So my first question for you is around this whole notion of urgency in manufacturing. So what does urgent really mean to you? <laughs> well, that becomes a um, daily, weekly conversation with your uh, what we call our site clients as our co-workers that are out, out in the field is, you know, someone will make a request for something needed. And I'm being very, you know, vague and doing this from a 50,000 foot view. But you um, it's always here. This is what we need. We need this widget, this part or these certain parts or whatever the case may be. and you know, we have a steady flow of, you know, items, obviously, in procurement, you know, so many things go automated, but when somebody reaches out to you, and they say, we need this, and you say, okay, well, how quick do you need it? Oh, no rush, just um, as long as we can get it on Monday, you know, and it's Friday afternoon, you know, no rush, and then you have to re-explain sometimes to the same people that, okay, that is a rush, as in people will be working through the weekend, and we will be, you know, renting the space shuttle to get it from their dock to our dock by Monday morning when you say you don't need it in a hurry. So basically, the communication of urgency means different things to different people and different aspects of the, you know, different functions that people have in the plant. You know, some people just don't get it, you know, and, until you explain it to them. Okay, I, I get what you're saying, but here's what's going to have to happen for you for, for, to get the results you're looking for, you know, and it's going to involve 15 emails, seven phone calls to get to the right people who can make it happen. And, you know, so I think, um, you get, um, a lot of, you know, 445 on a Friday afternoon. Hey, by the way, uh, we're going to, we've been working on this, you know, you find out we've been working on this project for the last two and a half days. And we realized that, um, we need to, uh, make sure these parts are here on site so we can, uh, you know, because there's going to be crews working on this, you know, first thing Monday morning and you're like, yeah, not going to happen. Or how much are you ready to spend to make that happen? So I could talk on that for days. So, you know, that Sarah. So anyway, um, that's uh, all I have on that. 
Awesome. Thank you for being with us today, Curtis. Oh, it's a pleasure and a privilege. Jonathan, I'm going to throw the next question back over to you, and hopefully our supply chain star in the making will find us interesting enough to come back. I, I see that was short-lived, three seconds, and we were too boring for him. So, Jonathan, what is the longest trip taken to solve a problem with a supplier? Well, uh, I can think of uh, one going back in my, my history of my, my supply chain experience where uh, my boss came to me one day and he said, hey, we've got a problem with our supplier in China. And I said, well, OK, uh, let me look into that. And he says, well, you need to look into that today. And I said, OK. So I basically had to, to drop everything I was doing, uh, find a flight uh, for a meeting that would occur in the next uh, day and a half. So. This was on a, a Tuesday, so I was able to find a flight uh, from actually Chicago to uh, Shanghai, and yeah, it got me there on on a <clears throat> on a Thursday. I had the meeting on a Friday, which was a very successful meeting. We were just going through some uh, production challenges and wanted to make sure that the supplier understood our requirements, understood the urgency. Yeah, that's something that that Curtis talked about. Uh, so yeah, I had uh, really almost a 18 hour trip to have a three hour meeting. And uh, it turns out that we had a, a team planning session in Mexico that Monday following. So I actually had to go on a plane from Shanghai uh, back to America and then over on into Monterey, Mexico uh, for that Monday morning meeting. So. I had a whirlwind across the world uh, type of trip in a matter of three days, but it was all really to make sure that our, our suppliers understood what we what we needed and how urgent and how important the, the problem was. But it was all good. And not to mention uh, your sleep gets a little messed up traveling internationally. Yeah. Uh, I was fortunate in that regard because the, the trip happened so quickly uh, that I didn't have time to adjust. So I felt like I really didn't suffer much from the jet lag. Chris, next question for you. Um, tell me about your experience with long lead time, something I'm hearing daily from our customers and from people in the industry who are constantly struggling with this. Yes. Okay. Um, you know, I mentioned that for a large part of my manufacturing career, I worked in an organization that manufactured very large and expensive equipment for the mining industry. Um, these machines were responsible for production in many of the surface mines that exist all throughout the world. You know, these mines, they operate 24 seven, 365 days a year with very limited downtime. In fact, any machine downtime is scheduled in advance. Mines have to plan months in advance for all the labor needed to disassemble the machine. And then all replacement parts to do the job need to be on site and available during the outage. Um, any delay uh, to this could lead to unplanned downtime. And depending on the mine and the mineral being extracted, this could cost uh, mining companies losses of hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour. So as the manufacturer supporting our customers globally, we had to work closely with them in planning for these scheduled maintenance periods. The challenge was that since these were large capital investments and only operated in certain conditions throughout the world, the number of manufactured units was small in any given year. So, you know, our annual production capacity was one drag line, 24 shovels, and 12 drills. And that was actually really a big year for us, which means, you know, we didn't have large numbers of units flowing through the factory at any given time that could help support parts required in an unplanned outage. We had to plan our inventory very carefully. Um, many of the larger assemblies or components that could uh, that could take a machine down if a premature failure occurred were anywhere from 35 weeks lead time to 52 weeks lead time. And trust me, 
there were plenty of premature failures. Uh, you know, there is nothing worse than telling a customer whose machine is down that they have to wait 40 weeks for a new component. They want to reach through the phone and strangle you. So, you know, to try and solve for this, we set up safety stock around the world based on the number of units and types of models operating there. Uh, we set up exchange programs so that we could remanufacture used components to a like new condition and store those uh, for parts exchanges in a, in a machine down situation. But most importantly, we had to work closely with our customers. Uh, similar to something that uh, Snia had said earlier, we really, you have to communicate, communi communicate, communicate. Uh, and if you're not working closely with your customers and you don't understand the equipment and the hours uh, and the operation, you really are gonna miss uh, the opportunity to plan uh, accordingly, especially for these longer lead time items. So Sarah, I can tell you uh, solving for long lead times is by far one of the most difficult supply chain challenges I faced supporting customers and trying to grow an aftermarket business. And Chris, it's interesting. I was having a conversation with somebody in the office about the whole just-in-time model. Yes. And I'm wondering if that's completely gone. Because before COVID, just in time was the thing. People didn't want any inventory. They wanted just the bare minimum so they could fulfill what they have. And now I feel like the entire market has pivoted and people are hoarding inventory and holding things as much as they can. Because you mentioned that example with the safety sock. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens over the next couple of years. Yeah, you know, I think it's certainly going to depend on the industry and the products. Uh, and I think uh, to, to really make just-in-time inventory work, you have to have such close relationship with your suppliers and that there has to be extreme trust. And um, depending on the types of products that you, you're, you're building or you're manufacturing, um, that could mean, you know, hundreds of suppliers in your supply chain to make just-in-time work. And yeah, I think it, it's a big challenge. And I certainly think uh, sitting here today, um, people have to rethink that just in time model for sure. And then you throw in, we're in holiday season, yes. you throw in seasonality into the mix yes. where you're balancing super short windows where you have consumer demand, maybe two, three, four weeks. And if you miss your mark, you're going to lose customers forever. And there's just a whole supply chain challenge around storing inventory versus just in time for businesses that have seasonal products. Yeah. And I, I will tell you in the digital commerce world, we've always said that availability sells, right? So you have an argument of, you know, should I lower my price? Often having stock is, is more valuable and you can demand a higher price if product, you know, when you have product availability. Um, but I think never more is that true than right now, right? So availability or having stock available, it certainly helps you sell. So, And if you don't have stock, your reputation is on the line and you can lose customers forever. If they're there to make a quick purchase, you don't have it, they've moved on to your competitor and they're not coming back. That's right. And, and certainly, again, with digital, there's an opportunity to quick, quickly look, search and find those alternative suppliers. So, yeah, it's, it's a it's certainly a challenge that every manufacturer is going through right now. I don't think that it skipped anybody. I haven't met anybody that that hasn't been affected. Yeah. Sneha, next question for you. Manufacturing is picking up on automation and we can do more of it. Your thoughts on where to look for automation in your roles? Yeah, um, I thought it was, uh, this question is so relevant specifically uh, that I am actually on a platform provided by Source Day who where all they think and do is about automate and you know make lives easier for us. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would keep it short, but I do, I did want to make sure and take time to, um, see if I could talk a little bit about, you know, RPA, robotic process automation. I mean, in the recent past, I've seen manufacturing catching up to automation. So they are not, you know, this like, we do want to go 
uh, towards digitization, digitalization, whatever that you call. And, you know, especially our focus on Industry 4.0 and, you know, um, a lot of other stuff. And while I am no expert here, I did want to talk about RPA and many, I'm sure many of us would have heard about it, but uh, something that, this is something that many industries are embracing so different varied industries not just manufacturing but every everything um every other industry as well and i would say that we should at least try and embrace this because it's not just about in um, this actually is pretty much about automating your business processes so using software or ai machine learning all that uh, fancy concepts but while it is you know we in manufacturing we really focus on automation on our production floors i've seen um and myself also been involved in actually uh, implementing robot, robots, cobots across the production lines. And while that's great, and we should continue and not stop any of that, um, um, and, but it's equally important to fake focus on making an efforts on how do we make our employees more productive and how do we automate redundant tasks that they have been doing in day to day their, their lives, whether it's a buyer, a planner, um, an inventory manager, anyone in, in any role. Uh, it's RPA actually powers you through some very good um, uh, automated workflows, especially that they are able, especially where you know if we in manufacturing have a lot of legacy systems that we sit on and it's hard to find apis apis meaning you know platforms that could connect to more smarter um tools and so i just really want to encourage every manufacturer out there to go out and look for tools like this there are cheaper tools available but definitely have some focus also on making your day-to-day -day life and uh, of your employees more productive as well so rpa was one of the example and um happy to share more if anyone is interested to talk about it yeah and i think sneha one of the things that is important to mention when you talk about automation is the risk factor if you're not automating work and you have people manually doing things like email like spreadsheets like faxes phone calls text messages no matter how good someone is they're going to make a mistake something is going to get missed, a formula is gonna be entered incorrectly, and that can cause a manufacturer millions and millions of dollars. And I think we can't stress the risk factor enough. Absolutely, absolutely, yes, uh, you, you, you nailed it there. We, the human error is always, a, always something that we should be wary of, and that's exactly a reason why you, one should actually look for automation in, uh, about the, tasks so be it you know and especially you know i think about accounting a lot here uh there are so many people still using literally paper to manage their account and their books and it's crazy people still send checks <laughs> they do <laughs> they do they do Curtis, next question for you is, can PODs be trusted and maybe start by explaining what that means to the audience Oh, okay. POD is just a industry term uh, for proof of delivery. You know, you going back to what we talked about previous and um, well, and first I want to make a comment. Um, please apologize to Sneha for making fun of paper, Sarah. I know that uh, from your past, but um, a proof of delivery is, you know, when you are looking for those, you know, tracking information for your, as we referred to earlier, uh, or as I referred to in others, uh, you know, you're trying to find now, now that you've got the stuff on order and the supplier has promised you the world, um, Chris, uh, you made comments earlier and I'm very familiar with uh, some of the things you were uh, discussing or trying to, uh, you know, with the uh, long lead times, you just want to reach through the phone and shake them like an Etch-a-Sketch and start over. Um, the uh, proof of delivery, you know, you're sitting there and you've gone through all the trouble, you jumped through all the hoops got your tracking numbers, everything's great. And then you reach out to one of your favorite box truck companies that they decided to use. And you ask them, okay, wait a minute, you know, the brown trucks, the red and white trucks, they're coming gone. Or where, where's our stuff? And you're like, oh, so-and-so signed for it. And you look at it and you go, well, he or she hasn't worked here in six months. So um, how's that possible? And you start wondering, you know, going back to the automation and they are graded on so much of uh, time that they don't take the time 
you know what I'm, I'm talking about. I'm not going to throw rocks at anybody more than I already have, but uh, because everybody's guilty of it. But um, they, they have certain um, key, you know, key indicators that they have to check off. You know, they show up when the vehicle stops, when the vehicle leaves, certain addresses, GPS, all that stuff. So they don't necessarily um, provide accurate information. So then you're backtracking, trying to find where that part is that, as several of us have mentioned, is costing hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour not to have or potentially cost uh, lost profit opportunities, as we like to refer to them. You know, so um, then you get into it and you realize that, oh, wait a minute. Why did you ship it via XYZ company? Oh, well, here's their proof. And they send it to you, the proof of delivery. Look at the POD. And it says, oh, no one home or, um, you know, no one home or customer closed for the close for business. Well, the government requires us to have somebody here 24-7, 365 because we're a chemical plant. So we're never closed ever. And so you go back to, you, you have to do your uh, heavy lifting up front and literally pound your suppliers. Um, sorry again, um, Chris, um, but uh, making sure that they understand completely that uh, yes, this is important and important. Let, let's define urgent and important to the nth degree. And, and then you have to convince, convince them that, you know, urgent doesn't mean, yeah, do it next day, flight next day, whatever, you know, you, you have to ver be very specific on your um, communication, not a, um, yeah, we need to hear tomorrow. You need to say, okay, you need to take it to this airport. You need to, you know, pay for dock to dock. Like, like I laughed about earlier, rent a space shuttle, whatever it takes to get it here when we need it. And then, you know, then you get, always get the suppliers that uh, aren't familiar with, you know, the lost profit opportunities that say, well, you know, that's going to cost X, Y, Z amount of dollars, or this is going, and you have to explain to them, I didn't ask you how much it cost. <laughs> I said, can you do it? You know, I need it here at this date and time because they don't get, you know, they don't live in our world all the time. Uh, you know, because so, so much, especially nowadays, like I think, Sarah, you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you fail a customer and they move on to the next, you know, you move on to the next supplier. Well, that's not always possible in, uh, in, in the industries, uh, some industries and with some commodities, you know, if you uh, have an Ingersoll Rand pump or compressor, Jonathan, you you have one place you can go back to get the parts, you know, so in uh, drawings and, it, you know, whatever the case may be. So anyway, that's kind of a starting point with POD, but just, uh, just to, to latch on to communication and, um, and urgency, you know, tying them back together. So uh, I think I've talked enough. Jonathan, what's the most interesting thing you've seen at a supplier facility? And no, no holding back here. We want that. We want. The <laughs> well, you know, we've talked a little bit about suppliers maybe being a little bit dense and they're getting pounded on and getting beaten up. But one of the suppliers I visited in China they were very positive uh, amidst all the, the the pounding and grinding that we, we threw their way. So the way they remain positive is they actually installed a karaoke club in their facility. And they wanted that karaoke club because it was a great way for all of the uh, employees of the, of the factory to get together, have fun, wind down, and actually get refreshed for uh, you know serving our orders. So while visiting uh, this supplier, they, they toured us through their whole club. They had purple couches, they had strobe lights, uh, they had a, a great list of songs that I even actually sang. Some of my favorites were uh, Last Christmas. Uh, that's perfect for this time of year. Uh, I'll spare everybody in, in the audience from singing that now, but uh, that was one of my go-to songs in the in the, uh, karaoke club in, in a Chinese manufacturer. So uh, yeah, that was pretty pretty interesting, pretty crazy. But it it really showed me that they they were keeping things positive, keeping employees engaged, uh, really just to serve us. So I think it was it was pretty good. Uh, I wish you would have taken a video of that. That make, would make for some great LinkedIn content, Jonathan. 
I, I've got them. Um, you know, maybe I, I should uh, release them. You know, it, it maybe have an NFT uh, going out there for a few of them, especially the ones with the uh, the purple couch. So, Chris, I am dying to hear the story about the latch free dipper. And I'm not even sure if I said that correctly. You said it correct. Yes, the latch free dipper. Um, this is a story about product innovation. Um, I, you know, I mentioned in the last story that in a former career, I was part of an organization where we manufactured large surface mining equipment. Well, one of those machines was an electric rope shovel. And to give you an idea of the size of an electric rope shovel, the weight alone is 2,800,000 pounds, okay? So an electric rope shovel is designed to lift large amounts of raw material. Essentially, it digs into a blasted rock face, kind of like this, and then it lifts the material in what is called a dipper. You might think of it like a bucket. And then it dumps the material into a very large dump truck through a dipper door. So the dipper door opens out of the, the bottom or the back. And each dipper load is designed to lift approximately 90 tons of raw material. And the dipper door design for many years has been open and closed with a latch. This latch gets tripped by the machine operator when they want to dump the raw material. The challenge is that the latch is the leading cause of downtime for an electric rope shovel. Um, depending on the operator or, or the operating conditions, this area of the machine is frequently repaired. So as a leader in the manufacturer of electric rope shovels, we came out with a new innovative product design that would eliminate the latch. And we called it the Latch Free Dipper. Um, we developed this design just before I had moved to Lima, Peru to support negotiations for three electric rope shovels for a new mining project in the country. And as an eager sales leader, I wanted to sell the first latch free dippers. Um, my team and I negotiated these shovels with the new design for over nine months. Uh, we explained how this design uh, increased MTBF or mean time between failure and reduced MTTR or mean time to repair. And long story short, we won the contract and this created a very special relationship for us uh, with this mining organization in Peru. Um, in fact, after negotiations were complete, I spent time with the mining operator's family members. You know, I attended birthdays, uh, we shared meals, uh, experiences and stories, and we were really cementing the relationship. And then it came time to deliver the machines. And, you know, machines of this size and capacity are not shipped fully assembled. They, can, they come in on multiple truckloads and flatbeds. And I think it's, it's something like 24 different rail cars left our factory to make their way to the mine. And then they are, are assembled right in the mining pit where they're going to operate for many years ahead. And everything was ready to ship except our newly designed latch-free dipper. Uh, as many of you listening know, innovation takes time, testing, reiteration, and further testing until it is fully ready. Well, we weren't fully ready with our design when it was time to build the equipment on site. So needless to say, I was disappointed. Uh, the customer was disappointed. I was really embarrassed and, uh, and we had to find a way within our organization to solve the problem. Um, did I mention that these shovels cost anywhere from 20 million to $25 million each? Uh, there was a lot at stake. So we ended up sending a latch design until the latch free was fully ready, which wasn't the end of the world, but it did teach me to carefully set expectations on anything I sold where the product design wasn't yet completed. Um, you know, sometimes supply chain delays can occur with the best intentions like developing a new technology. And, you know, while the new technology in the long run is still going to outperform the older technology, sometimes there are some interesting hurdles to cross before you get there. 
And uh, certainly setting customer expectations is really important. So um, is, that, is that product still in market today? And, and is that still the name of the product? Yes, it is. People can look up the Latch Free Dipper and find it. Interesting. <laughs> Sneha, as we close out, we've got about five minutes left. I'd like to have you share your thoughts on efforts that can be taken from moving a linear supply chain to a circular supply chain, and in particular, how this relates to people in manufacturing. Yes, um, thanks so much. I know we we have like barely five minutes left, and you know, I you know, so I can go on and on about this, uh, but I'll keep it short. I promise. Uh, going so right now, we really function in a linear circuit, linear supply chain model, and I do want to uh, share this message that going from a linear to a circular model doesn't have to be complicated. Little changes in wherever whichever role you are in in supply chain can really collaborate to make a difference, and you know. Being us being in manufacturing companies, we almost most of us really know about lean, and so use those concepts. While lean is about minimizing waste, that's what lean talks about. Circularity is about monetizing those waste. So it's not very different. Like the the idea is to actually work with waste, and it's it's super cool. Um, I'll just give you. For example, you know, uh, us, the procurement professionals, our year-over-year year year strategy is about reducing costs or very lately because of COVID, also focus on risk management. Uh, and I'm happy, very happy we're doing it and keep doing that. But let's add another one to it, which is, you know, sourcing secondary materials. It could actually be cheaper for us. And, you know, add that, you know, blend that in your strategy, see how things work out for you. And you never know, it could actually uh, work out very well. Uh, monetarily also operations quality look at your scrap see what you can we, we actually do that in some ways when we when we are pressed for the need to why don't you actually why don't we blend that in our process and look at our scrap see what we can tear down see what we can put that put back on shelf like these are little ways little ways on how we actually minimize our impact on our environment um, and actually slowly also try and move to the circular model. But uh, ping me, connect with me if you want to know anything about circular supply chains. I think supply chains are super powerful in making this concept happen. Trust me, it's not complicated. We all can do our little, uh, you know, little best to make this happen. And, you know, if we don't volunteer to start today, I really think we'll be forced to do it tomorrow. Uh, we are running out of time. Sneha, is there a manufacturer that stands out that you think has adopted this new model and is doing it well as kind of an example for people? I definitely want, I, I cannot name someone right mm -hmm. here, but I can definitely say that uh, any industries who are actually in repair mm -hmm. and uh, remanufacturability are really serving that cause. When you're actually, you know, looking into those repairs and trying to remanufacture and looking into your productive maintenance are small things that you know that you actually that add up towards moving um towards a supply chain concept but you know let's start with um, um unilever they're doing a lot like literally they had they are actually turning some shipping containers into their manufacturing lines isn't that cool uh, and that's that, that's actually scale. Like I, I cannot talk about scalability, but that's something that you actually can take and move, uh, collocate near your customer. You reduce your lead time. You're super close to them. Your demand fluctuations go down. You're able to predict your demand so much better. Like I mean, imagine living in a world where you're there. You you don't rely on your forecast. Imagine how awesome that could be for us in people in supply chain. But there's so many industries that I can I can definitely share more if someone is interested. Awesome. Well, we are at time. So I want to give a big thank you to Chris, Curtis, Nihan, Jonathan for sharing your manufacturing wisdom with us today. I know there were a lot more stories that you guys have lived through and experienced. So encourage anyone who would like to connect with any of our panelists today to reach out to them on LinkedIn. Again, this is a monthly show that uh, I'll be hosting. So if you got value out of today's session and would like to meet more manufacturing leaders, hear more train wreck stories and get more wisdom and learn from people who have been in the industry for a long time, you can join us again on January 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And with that, I'm going to wish everyone a wonderful afternoon.